on this Sunday night, bracing for a massive wave of COVID patients. The doctors and nurses shifting gears, preparing for things to get worse. The ICU is a, a nightmare, a nightmare with angels working in it. And the special order to get health professionals from other provinces into Ontario to help. India's devastating surge, the need for life-saving oxygen, and the countries ready to step up. The threat of a strike at the Port of Montreal and the federal government's 11th hour solution. Plus, Europe's big clubs thought they were a big deal until it all fell apart. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The third wave is hitting Canada with full force. Across the country, the rate of active cases remains higher than it has been throughout most of the pandemic. The good news is that nearly 11 million people have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. That's about 29% of the population. The case numbers, however, are still going up, with nearly 7,000 positive tests reported today. Keep in mind, not all provinces report on the weekend. In the coming weeks, doctors and nurses are preparing for more hospitalizations and more ICU admissions. Because as Mike Durley explains, COVID-19 can cut lives short in an instant. Warren Montgomery had become a fixture in Regina's food scene with his Louisiana-style cooking. Everybody, his wife Rochelle says, seemed to know and love him. And now they'll all likely want to go to his funeral after a short and painful fight with COVID-19. He was coughing so hard till he would throw up. He, and then once that would happen, like he couldn't breathe, he couldn't catch his breath. Um, it got to the point where he couldn't say a sentence, like he had to struggle with each word. The Montgomerys and their two daughters all contracted the virus, but it was Warren that got hit the hardest. In the span of a week, he went from a positive test to the ICU. I stayed with him and uh, it was only a matter of minutes and uh, he was gone. It was just like he went to sleep. Um, he was peaceful. It was quiet. The 42-year-old's case is not dissimilar to what doctors are seeing in hospitals across the country. Younger and far sicker patients. A snapshot of COVID in Canadian hospitals paints a troubling picture. The latest data shows a 22% increase in hospitalizations week over week, while ICU cases increased 21%. Ontario continues to be the hotspot in the country, but BC, Alberta and Saskatchewan are all seeing record numbers of hospitalizations. And in Atlantic Canada, Nova Scotia hospitals are prepping for new patients after recording its highest number of daily cases since the pandemic began. How are you doing, Dr. Strang? Thanks, Premier, for asking, but I have to say I'm a little nervous. Nova Scotia's premier and top doctor couldn't hide their anxiety, nor their anger at residents who have been hosting large parties. But the current fine does not seem to be enough of a deterrent. So we're doubling our fines from $1,000 to $2,000. What they don't want is to become another Ontario, where virtually the entire medical system is geared towards treating COVID-19 patients. Toronto's Mount Sinai Hospital recently opened up a third ICU. And now really the biggest problem is, you know, we've created this capacity, but it's really a human resource issue, right? We just don't have enough people to be able to care for all these patients. Ontario's Premier requested nursing help from Atlantic Canada, but it looks like they may soon be busy. Mike Drillet, Global News, Toronto. The Ontario government has approved an order to bring in health professionals from other provinces to help the growing number of COVID patients in hospital. The emergency measure also allows nurses within Ontario to provide care that's out of their regular scope of practice. But as Catherine Ward reports, critics worry there could be troubling consequences. As hospitals fill, as a new surge of COVID-19 takes hold, nurses are shouldering professional and personal burdens like never before. My heart breaks at work, my heart breaks when I get home. The bonds nurses and patients share has become even more critical with the pandemic. You know, last week I was literally just rubbing my patient's head and, you know, um, letting her know that the daughter said she loves her. A new order issued to Ontario hospitals, civil servants and unions last week under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act referenced here in this memo will allow healthcare professionals, including nurses, to provide patient care services outside their regular scope of practice. 
and also enables hospitals to employ, contract, appoint, or otherwise engage regulated health professionals from out of province. This provision only applies to nurses working in hospitals and only to prevent or alleviate the effects of the COVID-19 outbreak. The province says the goal for these measures is simple, help reduce administrative burden and allow hospitals to focus on delivering patient care while at the same time building up the province's health care workforce. The province says workers will not be asked to perform tasks they aren't qualified for. Some experts say there are still concerns. If in the rush of doing things, that RPN will do things that she or he is not competent to do, that nurse could be uh, reported to the College of Nurses. In an interview with the Canadian Press, Health Minister Christine Elliott says more than 40 health care workers from outside Ontario have already volunteered and more could be on the way, arriving as early as this week. But some critics remain skeptical. Number of nurses, RNs with ICU training or critical care training that will come from other jurisdictions, in our view, will be minimal. Still, for those feeling the pressure in hospitals across Ontario, many know nurses are the key to ensure things run as smoothly as possible, even under challenging circumstances. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. India is in a crisis with COVID-19 spreading beyond its control. It's believed a new variant of the virus is driving case numbers up. Today, the country reported nearly 350,000 cases, the world's highest daily toll since the start of the pandemic. Overburdened hospitals are turning patients away because oxygen tanks and beds are in short supply. So there's even greater urgency to get citizens vaccinated in a country which has 18% of the world's population. As Jennifer Johnson reports, India is calling on the U.S. to send help. As India reports over 300,000 new cases of COVID-19 a day, hospitals are being forced to turn away the sick and dying. The Indian government is rushing oxygen to overwhelmed medical centers by planes and trains, but there isn't enough. Doctors are now appealing to the world for help. When you walk outside the hospitals and you see that rush and people calling frantic calls, you know, crying on the phone that, please, can you help me for a bed? And all that I can say is, yes, I'm trying. Who would ever think there would be a shortage of oxygen to breathe? It's like terrible. Ventilators are being packed into trucks from the UK heading for India. The aim is to provide the support that the Indians need at their hour of need, really, if uh, uh, judging by the distressing scenes we've seen. The US government is also pledging to send aid immediately. There's discussions about really ramping up what we can do on the ground, oxygen supplies, drugs, tests, PPE, as well as taking a look in the intermediate and long run about how we can get vaccines to these individuals. Crematories are overloaded with corpses. Desperate residents are searching on the black market for oxygen tanks and the COVID treatment drug remdesivir any weapon to save their lives or their loved ones. We are facing a deep crisis. The smaller hospitals are getting closed because of the uh, supply chain issue of oxygen and more and more burden is coming on the larger hospitals. India thought the worst of the pandemic was over. Restrictions had been lifted. The government even allowed this huge Hindu festival earlier this month. But now people are dying in the streets. In the second wave, the, ca the cases are increasing exponentially. There is scarcity of beds, there is scarcity of oxygen. This cost you everything. Less than 2% of India's population is fully vaccinated against COVID-19. It is currently administering about 3 million doses a day, but some areas have run out of vaccine supplies. As this deadly surge continues to spread. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. And if things couldn't get worse, a fire has torn through a hospital in Baghdad that was treating COVID-19 patients. At least 82 people died and 110 others were injured. There are reports that began when an oxygen cylinder exploded inside an ICU. At least 28 patients on ventilators are among the dead. The wreckage of an Indonesian Navy submarine has been located split in three pieces. Underwater footage shows the fragmented vessel 800 meters below the surface of the Bali Sea. All 53 crew members on board died. The sub went missing Wednesday during a torpedo drill. 
More than 1,000 dock workers are ready to walk off the job at Canada's second largest port. The Port of Montreal handles about $275 million worth of goods every day. And any disruption could cost the economy $25 million a day. But as Mike Armstrong reports, the federal government is trying to avert economic disaster. With the strike deadline looming, the federal government is stepping in. Dock workers at the Port of Montreal planned to walk off the job Monday morning, but there is now back-to-work legislation set to be tabled. The announcement came in a series of tweets from the federal labour minister. Philomena Tassi says the government tried for two and a half years to help with a negotiated settlement and calls back-to-work legislation the government's least favoured option. But Tassi says a work stoppage at the port in the middle of a pandemic would be too big a blow to Canada's economy. The news has business groups hoping they've avoided a crisis. Well, we've been asking the federal government to step in for many weeks now, so we're very pleased to see that they are willing to intervene and ensure that there's a full uh, that the Port of Montreal is fully operational. The port's 1,150 dock workers have been without a collective agreement since December of 2018. They walked off the job for 11 days last summer before agreeing to a truce. In recent weeks, negotiations got bumpy. Dock workers went on an overtime strike. They're refusing to work weekends. The management group, the Maritime Employers Association, in response, said last week it was changing work shifts. The Longshoremen's Union Friday called that a provocation. The only way we could answer that is to uh, put a general strike for Monday. The work stoppage last summer cost the Canadian economy more than half a billion dollars. It didn't even last two weeks, but the backlog was so big, it took three months to catch up. A new strike would be devastating for, for the economy. The small, medium businesses are already on the ground. According to a source, the union has sent out picket assignments for Monday morning. That hasn't changed. Back-to-work legislation would still have to be tabled, debated and adopted. With a minority government, it would also need support from other parties to pass. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. Coming up, the real estate buying frenzy and the crisis facing young people. A reckless driver in Albania's capital drove through a blockade and into a crowded square. But his antics screeched to a halt when a daredevil jumped through the car window to stop the vehicle. Police believe the driver was under the influence of marijuana. The incident happened during the country's election, but it's unclear if there's a link. Home prices are skyrocketing across the country. That's good news for sellers, but for first-time buyers, the dream of owning a home is starting to feel like a fantasy. Housing analysts say Canada has an affordability crisis, one that could have long-term consequences. Here's our senior business correspondent, Anne Gaviola. Andres Peñalosa and his wife have been looking to buy a home in the Vancouver area since they immigrated to Canada from Venezuela in 2018. We've seen the bidding wars, we've seen houses selling way over asking price and it's, it's just very discouraging. They're part of a cohort of young workers under the age of 35, increasingly shut out of the housing market. A generation whose earnings have now suffered through two recessions and even though mortgage rates are historically low, prices are on a tear. Real estate broker Bethany King says in addition to a lack of supply, prospective home buyers aren't competing on a level playing field. They're up against buyers who have built up a lot of equity over the years. First time buyers are competing with baby boomer cash. They are downsizing and often going into those smaller single family homes that would normally be reserved for our first time home buyers. With home prices across Canada surging more than 31% in March, economists have been calling on politicians to cool the market. We need our hearts and our heads to lean in to the idea that we have an affordability crisis and we cannot have an affordable place to call home also be an exceptionally good return on investment. A recent report by the Bank of Montreal called on Ottawa to do something to break the market psychology and the buying frenzy fueled by a desire for more space and a fear of missing out. Critics say policy response has been muted. There are new tougher mortgage stress test rules set to kick in in June. And in this week's federal budget, there was new money to increase the supply of affordable housing and an empty homes tax, but no further measures to cool the housing market. And in the recent Ontario and B.C. budgets, housing was not a priority. 
Some say as long as the wealthiest Canadians depend on their homes as an investment vehicle, measures to douse the red-hot housing market will remain politically untouchable. Home ownership is more out of reach for a growing part of our population, and that means we need to change our hearts and minds about not in my backyard. We need to welcome more renters and co-ops in our neighborhoods, move beyond nimbyism to say yes in my backyard. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Still ahead, a federal election in a pandemic. We'll show you how you may end up voting. Preparations are underway for a potential federal election. With a minority government in power, it could happen at any time. Mail-in ballots will be key to a safe and successful vote. Elections Canada is preparing for as many as 5 million Canadians to use a mail-in ballot if there is an election this year. That would be historic because it would be 100 times more mail-in ballots than any other general election. David Aiken walks us through the process. So this is the package that's so coming in the mail. So this is the package. This is what we call a uh, special ballot kit. And you only get one if you ask for one. Unlike in the U.S. or elsewhere, no ballot in Canada is automatically mailed to you. New this year, going online to ask for your mail-in ballot. You will still need identification, though. It's the same thing as when you go to the polls. You need to prove who you are and you need to prove where you live. Elections Canada reviews your request. There is a physical person on the other end who will uh, check to make sure that, that your, your ID uh, is good to go. At the heart of the package you will then get in the mail is the actual ballot. That's the actual That's ballot. That's the actual ballot. It says specimen. It's not a real ballot, but uh, yours but will not say that, specimen. But other than that, it will yes. look, it'll be this grayish color. This grayish color. It's also blank. You will be expected to know the first name and last name of the candidate you want to vote for, and you have to write that in here. You cannot just put in the party. So if you just write, you know... Purple. Per, per, well, let's say we have a purple, purple party, party and a plaid party. Yeah, you put you plaid party, your ballot will not be counted. You then take your ballot and put it in envelope A. That's an envelope that has no identifying marks on it. Envelope A goes into envelope B. This is the envelope you have to sign and date, and if you don't do that, your ballot will get thrown out. Envelope B goes into envelope C. Postage is prepaid, now just drop this in a mailbox. No envelopes will be open until after the polls close on election night, and each one will be opened by hand and counted by hand. No machines are used, and that's a process that will take time. People should be prepared to expect delays in the okay. results, and we may not know the, the final results of the election on election night. And the mail-in ballots, just like every other kind of ballot cast in an election, are, by law, stored in this Elections Canada warehouse for 10 years, a complete paper record of a pandemic election. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. Up next, while the European Super League has everyone offside. When 12 of Europe's most successful soccer clubs plotted to join a breakaway competition less than a week ago, the move kicked off the sport's biggest crisis in half a century. The European Super League was only open to a handful of the world's wealthiest football teams. Owners envisioned a bigger bottom line, but they didn't anticipate the fastest collapse of a colossal business scheme. Critics say the competition was driven by greed. Fans, FIFA and Europe's governing body are still fuming. And as Eric Sorensen reports, the game isn't over. The Super League, the biggest clubs in soccer playing for billions of dollars. What's not to like? Well, for one, a lot of fans like these at Chelsea instantly hated the idea that rich clubs could get richer while abandoning the teams they used to play. From England... This is wrong. ...to Spain. Why did they do it? It's uh, only for the rich, uh, rich clubs and uh, more, more money. The Super League was to include the six biggest teams from England's Premier League, three top teams from Italy, and the three powerhouses from Spain. 
Clubs like Man U and Barcelona currently generate massive revenues that help smaller teams. The Super League would bring just the big teams together, with backing from banks, lucrative TV contracts, and their own deep pockets. Chelsea is owned by a Russian billionaire, Manchester City by a member of the Abu Dhabi royal family, Juventus by an Italian industrialist. Soccer has to evolve, said Real Madrid president Florentino Perez, favoring the league. New competition would generate more interest and more income. But the backlash was swift. Outside Liverpool's stadium, banners denounced the new Super League. Brighton players wore protest T-shirts, the league flying in the face of history, where teams earn their way into international competition. It's not competitive. It's a closed shop. You can't have a competition where no one else is allowed in. Soccer's establishment rebelled. The ultimate aim for some is no longer to decorate the club's trophy cabinet with silverware, but to fill the bank account with cash. And politicians vowed legislation to block the venture. It's not in the interests of, uh, of fans, it's not in the interests of, of football. Cracks began to appear. Manchester City backed out. Then the rest of the English teams. And within two days, the entire enterprise that seemed founded on greed imploded. La Superliga. From the Spanish league president, the Super League as it was conceived, he said, is dead. Liverpool's owner issued an abject apology to fans. I'm sorry and I alone am responsible for the unnecessary negativity brought forward over the past couple of days. And with that, the new Super League vanished like a bad dream. Liverpool players were back on the pitch. Atletico Madrid seemed happy to be back to normal. And those Chelsea fans were on the streets again, but this time chanting, we saved football. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is Dorchester, Ontario. Thank you for watching. Donna Friesen will be back at the anchor desk tomorrow, and I'll see you next weekend. Have a great night.